नमो तस् भगवतो अर्हतो सम्मा संबुद्धस् नमो तस् भगवतो अर्हतो सम्मा संबुद्धस् नमो तस् भगवतो अर्हतो सम्मा संबुद्धस् ओनर टू हिम द ब्लेस्ड वन द वर्थी वन द फुली एनलाइटेन्ड वन माय अटमोस्ट रेस्पेक्ट टू द परफेक्टली एनलाइटेन्ड सम्मा संबुद्ध the noble doctrine of the buddha and the noble maha sangha the disciples of the buddha hello dear dhamma friends welcome to our thursday dhamma talk series under this weekly dhamma talk series we will cover up some very important topics on theravada buddhism to help benefit our community around the world i certainly believe this effort by dhamma usa is going to open up an immeasurable horizon of dhamma knowledge among the stava community we are so delighted to have dr dad t uh, nigun as guest speaker today i am confident that he has been employed trained with both dhamma knowledge and practice dear dhamma friends please mark your calendar every thursday at 6 pm pacific time and 9 pm eastern time kindly check with the dhamma usa website youtube channel facebook page and facebook groups for more updates i am pretty sure you are going to enjoy the topic today which is does specialization or generalization benefit the meditator kindly post your questions in the comment sections of dhamma usa youtube channel and facebook account so that we can answer them at the end of the talk Without further ado, let me invite Dr. Dad T. Negan to start his Dhamma sharing about specialization and generalization benefit uh, the meditator. Please pay due attention seriously to achieve maximum benefit from today's Dhamma sharing. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you so very much, Ashal, for that introduction. A good evening, friends uh, and fellow meditators. Uh, I am Dot Nguyen. I am a friend and former fellow student of Venerable Sumita. He has uh, kindly invited me to share some thoughts uh, on the Dhamma this evening. Uh, I happen to uh, have been reading a book called uh, Range. Which is quite popular in the bookshelves in the last few years by uh, Mr. Epstein, and um, I, I, I came to realize that it covered some thoughts that I had for decades since my days uh, in the uh, at undergraduate uh, at UCLA, thinking about specialization and generalization. Since then, I have. Uh, Come to know meditation more, and so uh, matching the two together uh, seems to be uh, a, a right fit. So allow me to present just part one of two. Uh, I thought it might be uh, short enough to fit in uh, one presentation, but I realized that would be futile. So allow me to present part one. Uh, so uh, the title is "Does Specialization or Generalization Benefit Benefit the Meditator?" And here uh, I'm comparing the findings in Range, the book, to early Buddhist meditation. So I'm not going to apply Buddhist meditation to Range. It's just a one-way uh, presentation. The findings in this book. So allow me to clarify some preliminary uh, uh, thoughts. So uh, I'm using early Buddhism, not exactly Theravada. Uh, most of us are from the Theravada tradition, which I am also from. But my specialty is uh, within early Buddhism. Uh, so if anyone cares to find out more uh, about the distinction between the two, there is a relatively new book or handbook by Bhikkhu Sujato called "How Early Buddhism Differs from Theravada." A handy checklist. Quite helpful. It's free online. Uh, I should also stipulate that I have done zero literature review 
and research other than read the book range. Allow me to share a little bit about myself uh, so it puts uh, you know, uh, things into perspective. So you know um, my, my background and my interests. Uh, my main interest is early Buddhist meditation, early Buddhist philosophy, phenomenology, reincarnation studies, which were technically part of my training. Uh, uh, and related to all that is the philosophy of mind, philosophy of science, complex systems, parapsychology, happiness studies, and hospice. Uh, I am currently the executive director uh, of Lucent Hospice, and uh, uh, this is the right time for me to apologize if I was duly scheduled to present last week. Uh, being uh, uh, running a company uh, such as a hospice uh, has always unexpected uh, demands on time, and I apologize if. Um, everyone was waiting for a presentation, which I could not present. Uh, so apologize, apologies for that. And I, I, I found this quote that I, I, among my favorite poets, Emily Dickinson, because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. Uh, I, I was able to get this in because uh, there were no recent deaths at hospice. So allow me to continue. So, um, I realized I needed to put phenomenology and explanation about it in the very beginning because uh, it'd be very confusing otherwise. So briefly, phenomenology is you placing your mind within the mind and body, looking at the mind and body. Phenoma phenomenology was conceived by its founder, Husserl, as the truest and surest scientific method to understand consciousness with mind not brain, as the complete laboratory for this enterprise. Um, I discussed phenomenology, phenomenology in great detail in my dissertation, and if you Google some of those keywords, it's free on ProQuest. So uh, what are some features of early Buddhism that we need to discuss so that you know, this conversation makes more sense? So to start, uh, we should I should stipulate that my understanding of early Buddhism is that uh, we have never been in this territory before, never fully mastered that which we need to master, either in this lifetime or in previous lives. So we're not returning to any territory or stages or knowledge that we had come to and lost. So in other words, it is new territory. This is relevant because uh, range covers that a little bit, so I thought I'd clarify that. Uh, okay, so early Buddhist meditation is clearly a form of phenomenology. Uh, I, I believe I demonstrated such in my dissertation, and uh, it, it is a fertile ground for mm, learning more about early Buddhism uh, by learning from a um, hundred plus years of uh, phenomenological studies and research, and I believe it can go the other way as well. Uh, okay, so what did the Buddha ask of us? He asked that we specialize in bhavana, which is mental culture and meditation, or more clearly stated, that we practice for knowing the mind, shaping the mind, and freeing the mind. So if we ever get confused, we can always go back to this. This is like the mission statement, all right? Knowing, shaping, and freeing the mind. Mind is mm, at the very core of our concerns. So uh, of course there are other subspecialties or other teachings that get us to master this, the knowing, the shaping, and the freeing. Okay, meditation is about doing, and this is quite key. Um, I keep on going back to this aspect of the doing. Uh, knowing and doing are not quite the same thing. So we do and we know. We, we, we are less concerned about knowing. But it is true that we do to know. And the knowing is for the shaping and the free. So the knowing is not truly the, um, the end goal. 
meditation is entirely about turning bad skills into good skills for knowing, shaping, and freeing. So what is it that we're supposed to, uh, what skills are we supposed to know? Skills that lead to, that, to passion are unskillful, and those that lead to dispassion are skillful. This is pretty much the heart of early Buddhism. Uh, uh, a few more points. So um, the mind and the body is the laboratory. And this I'm trying to use scientific words because um, there it, it is relevant later as I talk about it. The mind and the body is the laboratory. The Buddha said, in effect, from the top of the head to the tips of the feet, herein lies the origins and the ending of suffering. We do not need to go anywhere else. Actually, we cannot go anywhere else. The problems and the solutions are in the body and in the mind. So uh, getting ready in the morning and commuting to work, which is the lab, is not the work. So you get up, you brush your teeth, you change your clothes, you fight traffic. That's not work. You don't get paid for that. Well, you have to do that to get to work and you get paid and you do the real work at work, which is the laboratory. But the work of getting there is required to do the work. And concentrating is this getting the mind to be in the mind and body. So it's required, but it's not the work. Uh, the last point uh, before we get into the book is that the Buddha and Freud agree that the mind is furtive. It lies to itself and it engages in subterfuge. Quite important. What is range about and what does it claim? Well, Epstein uh, wrote a direct and successful, in my opinion, rebuttal to Malcolm Gladwell's popularization of the 10 hour early start in life specialization advice. I'm pretty sure most of us have heard of um, this advice. It's strewn throughout the um, uh, media, mainstream media, that if we are to be, um, to achieve any degree of mastery in any, anything that we do, we must put focused, uh, a focus, uh, um, with a lot of passion into uh, targeted practice. 10,000 hours is the order of magnitude for this. So Gladwell in his book, Outliers, uh, uses two oh, uh, great examples. He said, if you want to succeed like Tiger Woods or Judith Polgar, who is um, a woman's chess world champion, you must start early in childhood and put in thousands of hours of intense practice. So on the left here, we have uh, the 10 hour early start uh, advice. And on the right, we have David Epstein's um, counter to that advice. So let's see what uh, Epstein has to say and how that may be relevant to our task at hand. So if you want to be the best meditator in the world or that you can be, should you apply the 10,000 hour rule? Yes, Gladwell says yes. He definitely says yes. Epstein, well, if meditation were anything other than a phenomenological activity, the answer from Epstein would be a simple no. Right? He would say no to everything. He believes in range, not uh, the 10 thousand hour rule. Epstein's studies should apply to most or all human endeavors, but we're dealing with phenomenology and it is of a different kind and that poses issues for a clear answer. So on the left again is what uh, Gladwell would propose and on the right is what uh, Epstein claims the world is like. 
So these are not my terminology. This is Epstein's terminology from previous studies that uh, the 10,000 hour rule only applies to kind or closed games, enterprises, or systems. And I'll explain that in a bit. Versus wicked or open systems. Okay, what are kind and closed systems? They have clearer boundaries of the rules of the game or enterprise. They have more limited rules and boundaries, and they're more procedural, meaning you start with A, then B, then B to C. So repetition, repetition gets you better at it. What are some examples? Checkers. You can you can really get good at checkers if you practice 10,000 hours. Same thing with chess. Same thing with golf. Same thing with mm, a fire marshal trying to put out a fire that is of a certain limited of stories, about one to four story. An example of this is Tyree Woods, who started golfing early and practiced thousands of hours. And according to Gladwell, this contributed to him being who he is today. So on the right side here, Epstein doesn't dispute that Tiger Woods became very good because he started early and that he practiced for many thousands of hours. Uh, what he disputes is that uh, the 10,000 hours does not apply to anything more complicated, more advanced, uh, anything with less boundaries in the rules, right? Because the wicked world, <laughs> sounds weird, the, the games and enterprises of the world have wicked rules. They're complicated, right? And they're open systems, right? They have less boundaries. They have less uh, rules. They are less procedural. They're way more conceptual, right? So he says anything at the tennis level or higher, you, you've got a, a, a wicked system, right? Or anything above a four-story building, it, the variables involved are such that um, you cannot learn by procedure. It becomes too, it becomes beyond the human mind to learn in a procedural way. So, you know, being a housewife or running a business, all that is well within uh, being too complex for uh, what uh, Gladwell proposes. An example of this is Roger Federer, the best in the world at what he does. And he started tennis very late, but he engaged in range or broad experiences. He played, um, you know, he played golf, he played badminton, he played jazz, he did everything. He is very, very broad and he got into tennis late and he is the best at what he does. So are there more examples to, to support this? Uh, Range offers many, many studies that show broadening your skills by adding more skills makes you better at all of those skills. Example, if you play five musical instruments and the piano is one of them, you're much more likely to be better at the piano than the pianist who only plays the piano, given equal practice time. So this is quite mm, counterintuitive. Uh, but uh, be the, this is the claim. Uh, further, Nobel laureates have significantly more extracurricular activities than non-winners. The, the studies show it uh, over and over again. These are clear, clear evidence uh, brought forth by these studies. So the list abounds with many studies pointing to broad exposure being superior to practice when the practice is without the broad exposure. So it appears that making the mind experiment and make connections between different domains, different domains of practice, experience, skills, right, provides more insights into each of those domains. So this is one of the, the, the critical um, claims by Epstein. So, um, uh, I apologize for the dense uh, quotes here, but some of the key thoughts from range are these, and allow me to, in red, 
uh, give my thoughts. Exposure to the modern world has made us better adapted for complexity, and that has manifested as flexibility. Oops. So this is a relevant uh, quote. The Buddha and his disciples did not live in the modern world, right? But we're not talking about that. We're talking about he was in the ancient world. Yet they achieved mastery. It could be that his milieu was urban, right, or modernized. Or alternatively, meditative training instills a certain adaptation to complexity and manifest as flexibility. So the training in and of itself um, allows you to master adaptation and flexibility within phenomenology. Uh, what is that? Okay, what does that mean? Okay, <laughs> they must be taught, next quote, they must be taught to think before being taught what to think about. Students come prepared with scientific spectacles, but they do not leave carrying a scientific reasoning Swiss knife. So Epstein is saying mm, the world is getting very complicated. And if we just engage in a few domains and learn procedurally and by rote, the learner is going to be in trouble. So obviously the, Epstein is not talking about meditation. He's talking about mm, being a versatile in this world. And even though we come in with certain uh, scientific, uh, a certain scientific mindset, if we don't have the full, a more full set of uh, scientific skills, uh, we will likely fall behind. But my answer to this is my, my comparison to meditation is this: the word perception or sanya comes to mind here in our comparison. Meditation Buddhist meditators are Experts at what? One, viewing their own perceptions from a higher perch called metacognition. Two, they objectively watch and select and control which perception is appropriate for the current task. So I use the word objectively because this is supposedly within phenomenology there is an objectivity to the mind uh, during the task of meditation, making it um, having scientific uh, principles. And we are, I write here, uh, Anatta, uh, I, 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 when I wrote this, it occurred to me that this is one of the better definitions of Anatta that I've seen. So Anatta, it does not make a, um, the knowledge claim that I spoke about earlier, an objective knowledge that we arrive at. It is rather a, a perception that we choose to take an objective one whereby we perch from a higher perspective and look and choose perceptions which can guide us to uh, the, the goals of uh, early Buddhism. Uh, next quote. No tool is omnicompetent. Uh, I read this and it, 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 the light bulb came on because uh, sanya perception is not a reality, merely a tool. There is no one omnicompetent tool. Even the perception anatta is not one. It is one among many, many tools um, provided in the suttas for us to practice meditation. Uh, there's another quote here, but I realize I wish to save that for part two. Uh, next quote, being forced to generate answers improves subsequent learning, even if the generated answer is wrong. So just the, that's like going to a laboratory, right? So you practice how to, uh, the, to um, carry on the experiment. You practice how to run the, uh, the, the lab. You practice how to get to the lab. You practice uh, and be observant to when you fail and when you succeed or when you're near succeeding. So in this sense, it's like a lab. Failure leads to eventual success. But I make a further point. 
This uh, certainly applies to meditation, but there is a, even a finer point. There is no one person, no book, no source other than your direct questioning and your direct answers that you get that will bring you to more refined skills. These are your answers. Only you can ask these questions. Only you can get the answers within uh, your meditation. And I believe this is the real meaning taught in the Kalama Sutta. There are many opinions about this, but this is, uh, I believe, the, 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 the right um, interpretation. Uh, only you can convince yourself to let go of something. That is, prove to yourself by testing your mind using different perceptions to demonstrate to yourself which is the more peaceful, easeful, skillful. But only you can determine what is peaceful for you and easeful and skillful. It is like a laboratory. Uh, it is like a, like, like a laboratory in that it is repeatable. You can repeat it. Once you have found that feedback, that successful feedback, it is repeatable. So there is that objectivity in there. And once it is demonstrated in the lab, it can be used outside of the lab. So outside of meditation, you can have that tool as well. Uh, next quote, struggling to retrieve information primes the brain for subsequent learning. Even when the retrieval itself is unsuccessful, the struggle is real and really useful. So um, in contrast to some systems where the struggle is for the struggle's sake, this is not the case here. The struggle is not for the struggle site. It is for the improvement of the meditator uh, and knowing and shaping and freeing the mind. There is a goal beyond the struggle. The, str the struggle is for the goal. Uh, next quote. Learning deeply means learning slowly. Yes, meditation is very deep and it requires a slow, gradual method. There's controversy about that, so I just thought um, I'd make that comment that uh, uh, there is um, a parallel between what Epstein is saying and what the, uh, the suttas say. Okay, right. this may be the last slide. Uh, further, uh, a next quote, analogical thinking takes the new and makes it familiar and takes the familiar and puts it in a new light and allows humans to reason through problems problems that they have never seen in unfamiliar context. So this is why I said at the very beginning, where the meditators asked to enter territory they have never experienced before. So they are given tools on more how to approach it. So Epstein is saying, for example, uh, water flow is used to explain electricity. Software, hardware, a dichotomy is, uh, is used to explain the brain and consciousness. And neural networks is used to explain artificial intelligence. So this is what you know the, the mainstream science uses. They use analogies as well. And it is very effective in clarifying uh, the new branches of science by using the previous branches of science. Uh, so because meditators are instructed to enter new and unfamiliar problems and territory, they are given a myriad a number of analogies in the suttas. Suttas are full of analogies, uh, I believe, uh, for this purpose. Right? All the analogies are to be understood under a grander scheme. Uh, next one. Deep analogical thinking is the practice of recognizing conceptual similarities in a multiple domains or scenarios that may seem to have little in common on the surface. It is a powerful tool for solving wicked problems. So Epstein is saying, let's just cross out the simple stuff. We're, we're, the world is full of non-simple stuff. 
to get by, to, to gain mastery, we need to deploy deep analogical thinking. And this is what I believe the suttas also advise. So this is my thought. Remember that wicked problems are ones which have many more variables and uncertainty in how one is to approach them, and there is an uncertainty in the outcome. Uh, so there is mu much less of a clear feedback loop, and there, the feedback loop is much harder to detect and find. So we are the meditators. Um, the meditators' um, uh, duty is to be an investigator, to to become very sensitive to the mind, so that he or she is able to detect certain feedback loops of the mind. Remember what I said earlier that uh, both the Buddha and Freud agreed that the mind lies uh, as a default. But it is clear that there are feedbacks that can and must be found. Uh, let's see, I believe this may be the last one. So human intuition, it appears, is not very well engineered to make us make use of the best tools when faced with what, uh, what researchers call ill-defined problems. Our experience-based instincts are set up well for tiger, I believe this is the tiger woods domains, and the kind world, where problems and solutions repeat. They repeat, meaning um, you, you ping something and it gives a very certain answer. You know, uh, you, you swing the golf in a certain way, you get a certain result. There are much less, hmm, forces, less variables affecting the outcome of a golf swing. Uh, there are, but just not nearly as much as in an open system or in a wicked world, according to Epstein. So compared to closed and kind worlds like table tennis, the problem is much more well-defined. The ball hits the other side, or if it doesn't return, you get a point. When you reach a certain score, then you win. That's pretty straightforward, pretty simple rules. The shape of the table is also a certain size, the paddle is regulated, the ball size is regulated, the rules, who, uh, who can play, all that is regulated, and therefore uh, it is a much more simple system, uh, and, and therefore it is well-defined. Most of the world is much or ill-defined. So the Buddhist meditator's goal is much closer to the ill-defined problem. So even the Four Noble Truths makes it makes clear the position of the problem from the very start. The sheer amount of variables involved makes it a complex system, not just complicated. Okay, uh, let's see, last quote, I believe. In a wicked world, relying upon experience from a single domain is not only limiting, it can be disastrous. So this is where there may be a value in this study. Um, it's, uh, it's not just, it has uh, real world ramifications. Let's say you uh, are a breath holding world champion and it took you 30,000 hours to reach this mastery you'd be prone to have the perception in your mind, calm the mind and body. That's your mastery, which be, would be excellent for only one part of the multitude of skills required in Buddhist meditation. That 30,000 hours was not properly used for the many other required skills. Remember the previous quote, there is no one omnicompetent tool or skill. It might be disastrous, for example, for a monk to enter a cave, be determined to use, um, be used what he is convinced is the uh, omnicompetent skill, and he would be mistaken. So, I believe this, that was the last page. So, Successful problem solvers are more able to determine the deep structure of 
a problem before they proceed to match a strategy to it. And this is one of the strengths of Buddhism, I believe. So yes, the Buddha did describe the problems as hard to fathom, right? Matching strategy is a hallmark of all the directions. Yes. Right, matching strategy is a hallmark of all the instructions. For instance, do you always apply energy, Virya? No, not always. Yes, when there is sloth and torpor, but not when the mind cannot settle into serenity and joy. Further, for instance, do you always apply equanimity? No, not always. Yes, yes. when the perceptions of Karuna and Medita are not under control. No, not when Karuna and Mudita are not overwhelming and the practice is, is not optimal. So in short, you apply skills at the right time in the right context, right? So you match strategy to the problem. Uh, yeah, do you need a, you need a mixture of strategies? So yes, above. Uh, that's, that's the end of the slides there. Um, so um, again, so this is just part one of two that I wish to present. Remember, so this, as you can see, I have not fully answered the, the title of the presentation, the specialization or generalization benefit the meditator. I hope that the audience is getting the gist of where I'm headed, uh, but uh, allow me to uh, present the remainder of it uh, the next time we meet. And in the meantime, uh, perhaps uh, the audience can uh, get the book range and uh, familiarize themselves to that and benefit from that as well. Uh, thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Dr. Dat Negan, for this profound speech on topic specialization or uh, general generalization benefit the meditator. I'm sure all of our Dhamma friends around the world were benefited today. We will take up your questions now and we encourage you to post your questions in simple language to the Dhamma USA YouTube channel and Facebook account. Uh, doctor, we have a question from Navodhya Kalpani. Uh, why should we meditate? Okay, very fundamental question. So we have in our modern world uh, a, a, a portion of people who mm, do not take the Buddha's uh, teachings to be transcendent. And those folks believe that meditation is good only for within this life. Uh, for calm, peace, harmony, uh, you know, reduction of stress, all quite mundane. Uh, but it is quite clear that the Buddha taught it for much, much more uh, grand a, uh, a goal. Uh, his goal is, as I stated above, it is to, um, to know the mind, to shape the mind, and ultimately to free the mind from the rounds, of, the fact the rounds of birth and rebirth. So ultimately, that is the the grand and broad answer. Thank you. Uh, uh, yes, doctor. Uh, I'm myself. I have a question. Yes. Uh, that is, uh, what is a good time to meditate and how long, averagely, how long uh, should I meditate per day as a, I would say as a beginner? Because since I, I was meditating for like two years now. Well, I'm very glad that you do meditate. My answer is, it is better to meditate consistently, even if it's 15 minutes a day, than five hours once a day a week is better to do 15 minutes a day than five hours once a week. There is that momentum that one builds. There is that 
familiarity uh, that the mind is not allowed to um, find a base for itself, which is the mind. The mind finds a place in itself, which is kind of funny, but it is just so. And in terms of where and when, this is this is tricky because it can go either way. If ideally possible, it should be in a place where you designate in your mind as a place where it is uh, sacred to you, calm, peaceful, and your body and your mind associates it with calm and peace and a place to meditate. And it preferably to do it at the same time every day. But having said that, uh, it should not discourage you from switching up the places or discourage you from switching up the times and the duration. So it is just ideal, but it should not discourage you from meditating truly all the time, right? Which is basically to put yourself, the moment you can practice by placing your, your mind within the mind and body, you have achieved some degree of meditation. So uh, practicing that mental muscle to bring you centered in the mind and body is a critical key. Um, yeah, so that, that, that would be my answer. Thank you so much, Doctor. We have another question from the USA, and it is, uh, why is Buddhist meditation significant? Why is this significant? Uh, so the Buddha was uh, single-minded. I, 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 he truly was one of the most single-minded persons I think I've ever read, uh, and which is uh, folks, oh, wake up. You're, the clock is ticking. Uh, you will run out of time, and you may come to very much regret not coming to a place in your mind where you have become dispassionate about the world and then it will be too late and you will be swept away. That is very, very much the message of the uh, the suttas. And the, the way out is to meditate and therefore meditation is highly significant to the Buddha. Thank you so much, Doctor. I think that's all the questions we have for today. Uh, with that, we conclude today's Dhamma sharing, and we look forward to meeting you with more insightful Dhamma sharings in the upcoming weeks. Let's keep our palms together, close to our hearts, and pay respect to the founder of the Dhamma USA, Venerable Bhante Sumitta and Dr. Tati Negan with three sadhus. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. May you always be well, happy, and healthy. Let's also keep our palms together, close to our hearts, and pray that by the power of all the dana, sila, and bhavana activities that we all have performed during our lifetime, and during our whole course of samsara. Become one united power and may it be. Shared with all the celestial beings, may all the wonderful celestial beings, including Brahmas and Devas, and all the sentient beings receive this merit and share this merit and be well, happy and healthy, wherever they are. May all your departed loved ones and all other ancestors also receive this merit, be well, happy, and healthy, safe, wherever they are. May all of us be able to live, ha live a happy life peacefully, happily, and with good health. May all of us and all sentient beings be able to attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana, the absolute peace and happiness at the end of our samsara. Thinking this, please keep your palms together, close to your heart, and say three sadhus. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. See you again next week at the same time, and triple gem bless you all. Sadhu. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you, Doctor.